State your name. I'm Dr. Sonny W. Herford III. Your profession and career? And I'm a medical doctor. Now, before I was a medical doctor, I was a farmer. And uh, after I finished medical school, I started practicing in Huntsville. And I was the uh, school doctor for Oakwood University, for Alabama A&M University. And then I taught at uh, Alabama A&M for eight years, starting in 61. And I taught at Calhoun for 15 years, starting in 95. Okay. All right. Year, what is the year that you attended Council High School and, and what year did you graduate? Okay, now I started at Council High in um, 1937 and I went there for two years and then they built the Winston Street School and uh, the students who lived on the north side had to transfer to Winston Street. So I transferred to Winston Street for the third and the fourth and the first semester of the fifth okay. and then had to go back to council high for the second semester <laughs> okay. of the fifth grade <laughs> okay. and then uh, back to Winston Street again for the uh, sixth grade okay. and then uh, uh, re-entered council high in the seventh grade and I graduated in 1949. Okay. Uh, our class had a hundred members when we started and we graduated 17 members mm. in that class. We had only three young men in the, in the class. Okay. Did you reside anywhere near Council High School uh, back during that time? No, the whole time that I was going to school, uh, I lived on Blue Spring Road. Okay. Blue Spring Road, I was born uh, uh, at the uh, intersection of what is now the intersection of um, the Parkway and Max Luther. Okay. But that used to be a farm out there and that was a farmhouse <laughs> out there. And then uh, we later moved a little farther up Blue Spring Road up near where the uh, First Missionary Baptist Church is now. And uh, we used to have to walk to school from there to Council High, yeah. which was about six miles. Mm. <laughs> six walk. miles one way. So you had six miles in the morning, six miles in the afternoon. And school started at, um, at that time, started at 8.30. And school was out at uh, 3.15. So uh, in the wintertime, it was dark when you left home and dark when you got back home. Because mm -hmm. it would take you approximately two hours to get to school and approximately two hours to get mm -hmm. back home. Okay, how would you rate the education received at Council High School? Well, when I enrolled in A&M and I started uh, listening to some of the other students with their English and watching them perform in the mathematics and also in the science classes, mm -hmm. I realized that we had had a superior education at uh, Council High. We had some excellent teachers at Council High and they showed great interest in the students. And, uh, I think they prepared us for our life's vocation. We did not have advisors and counselors. I wish we had, but the teachers just took it upon themselves. And when they found out that uh, I wanted to be a physician, then uh, a number of the teachers helped me to prepare to go into medical school. Were there any instructors who influenced you to a significant degree? Yes, yes, I remember quite a number of them. <laughs> there was one, uh, Mrs. Swope, who incidentally for years lived right next door to me, at this house right over there, mm -hmm. next door to me. And um, she uh, influenced me even at the time when I was at Winston Street School and at Council High School in uh, Science and history. And then there was uh, Mrs. Helen Fear, whose husband was a dentist. And when she found out I wanted to be a physician, she was just so elated about that. And uh, she helped me a lot. And uh, back in those days, we didn't have a library at the school. Mm -hmm. And we could not go to the public library. But a lot of the teachers would bring their books from home, 
if I wanted a particular book, if they had that book, if they had something similar to that book, they would bring them to the school and allow me to uh, carry them to my home and read them. We had, to, I think, five or six students um, out of about 700 who wanted to be physicians. Mm -hmm. And the teachers uh, really did uh, help them along, give them encouragement and inspiration. I can't imagine no library. But no library. It's not that no at that <laughs> time. Sorry. I just can't uh, imagine. But no, no gymnasium, no lunchroom, no chemistry lab, no biology lab. They had a room that was supposed to be the chemistry lab, but it had only about like three or four test tubes in the room <laughs> <laughs> and a beaker, one beaker and one Bunsen burner. And then it had about six reagent bottles in there. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to be our chemistry lab. Wow. And, but it, it was, it, it, the door, the inscription over the door said chemistry lab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it wasn't really a chemistry lab. Okay. Okay, you said. And uh, so guess what? I built me a chemistry lab at my home. Yeah. And uh, uh, sometimes when we were doing experiments in chemistry, I would take chemicals from my home <laughs> down to the uh, Coach Kellum was my chemistry teacher, and I heard him mention several times that uh, he was so appreciative of the fact that I would bring these chemicals from home. We would use them at the school. Okay, that's good. That's good. Coach Kellum did more than just. Oh, yeah, back in the old days, the us. coaches were not just coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know all of the things that he did, but I can tell you the things that I know about. Okay, first of all, he was the football coach. He was the basketball coach. He was the baseball coach. He was the track and field coach. Um, he taught me history, and he taught me chemistry. And um, that was in the daytime. Okay. And then they had a veteran school and he taught the returning veterans at night when the guys came home after the uh, Second World War. Okay. He taught them at night. Hmm. <laughs> that's what he did. <laughs> Can you imagine one man doing that? No. But that's the way they used to do. Hmm. That's, that's the way they had to do. Oh, I forgot one other thing. Uh, they did have, they did not have a lunch room as such but they had a little place where they sold candy and ice cream mm -hmm. and things like that. And uh, he was the head of that department. Oh. And I used to work for him. And my wife and I laugh about it now. She said, he never should have put you in charge of the ice cream. <laughs> 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 but uh, those are the things that I know about. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be some other things that, that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. So I guess with there not being a cafeteria, all the children brought their lunches to school. Yeah, we, we brought our lunch, and then there were some stores in the community. Uh, kids would get permission from the teachers to walk to the stores. Uh, some of them were just one block, and some might have been two blocks. And they'd get permission from the teachers to walk to the stores to get their lunch. But, but that's the way it was. And many of us did not have lunch. Uh, you left home about, uh, well, it's about 6.30 in the morning mm. and you ate your breakfast before you left home and then you didn't get another meal until about like uh, 5, 536 o'clock. Yeah. You see, but that, that's, that's the way it was and, and some of us, we, when we took our lunch, uh, we'd have maybe one sandwich or something like that and then uh, maybe drink some water or something like mm. that and then uh, some of the, the kids would go to the stores and get a bag of potato chips, you know, and this would be that lunch. And, then some of the stores would sell uh, pork skins and cracklings and things like that, and, and that's that's what they ate. Mm. Mm. But I've never been to a school in my life that had a lunchroom, a gymnasium, a library, school buses. Never in my whole life. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't even know what it looked like on the inside of a school bus when I was growing up. If somebody had asked me, uh, if they promised me a million dollars to describe what it looked like on the inside of a school bus, I could not have done it. I didn't know what it looked like on the inside of a school bus. Now, when we used to walk from uh, Blue Spring Road to Council High, uh, all the roads were 
dirt roads and they were narrow. And there were school buses with the white children. And when they passed by us fast, they blew dirt in our face, dust in our face. When they passed by us slowly, you may not believe this, rotten eggs and rotten tomatoes would come from the windows of those buses and hit us in the chest and in the face. And finally we got so whenever we'd see the school bus coming, we'd get off the road mm -hmm. and go over into the bushes so that we wouldn't be hit. Mm. And I suspect the uh, driver knew that those kids were doing that. But uh, nobody ever did anything about it. Wow. Never. But that's, that's what we had to endure, trying to get to school. Oh. And uh, I mentioned this too now. We were six miles from school. Now, um, you don't have too many snowstorms here now. Maybe one or maybe. Mm -hmm. But we used to have three, four, five, six snowstorms every winter. And we still had to walk to school, even though you had a snowstorm. We, we still had to walk to school. Wow. <laughs> That's right. Boy, mm -hmm. oh, so we really But we were determined. Late. We were determined. Okay, then, uh, by me living on the farm, see, sometimes you may have to miss a day or two, uh, three or four days, because of the real bad weather. Then, by me living on the farm, uh, in the spring, sometimes I'd have to lay out of school to help with the planting of the crops and then in the fall to help with the harvesting of the crops sometime I would have mm -hmm. to, to lay out of school and uh, uh, I didn't want to but the parents insisted because you know sometimes you have to get that crop out before that crop gets ruined by the weather you know? right. yeah, you do, do you remember and that was our only way of making a living mm -hmm. do you remember what year council high school was built council high no mm -hmm. no I wish I knew but yet it was built. Yeah. I remember when Winston Street was built, but not, not Council High. Mm -hmm. I was just curious when you, like you said, you when, left when the I school knew and anything, went to that school. When I knew anything, Council High was already up. My brother had attended Council High. He's seven years older than I. Mm -hmm. And he had attended Council High. And I, I heard a lot of other people say that they attended Council High. So evidently, it must have been there a long time. But the, the first time I knew that it existed was about like 35 or 36. I was born in 31, mm -hmm. and uh, I used to go down there. My father would take me down there if my brother was in a program or something like that, you know. So when I was four or five years old, I, I knew that school was there, but I didn't get a chance to go until I was six and a half. Okay. Hmm. okay. Were your future career path developed while attending Council High School? Yes, yes. As I said before, I sort of... Um, um, chose um, my profession when I was early. At first, I wanted to be a painter or a sculptor, and then a little bit later, I wanted to be a, a research scientist. Now, shall I tell you how I got to want to be a research scientist? Okay, I was in seventh grade, um, maybe the eighth grade at Council High. And uh, the guys in the back were making paper airplanes and spitballs and things like that. And uh, I wanted to be back there with the action, you know. So my teacher, there was a teacher named Miss Bernice Romine Penny. And uh, she uh, saw me back there with these guys, these bad guys. And there was one goody goody up at the front. Mm -hmm. And she came to me one day and she said, uh, you know, your father's the minister. And she said, I believe you want to be a good guy. She said, but you're back here with all these bad guys. She said, I want to move you up here with this good guy, you know. And he may help you to be good. His name was Jackson, James Jackson. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the last place I wanted to be, okay. <laughs> up to the front of the class. But she moved me up there. And so the, the next day, this guy comes to class, and he brings these two little bottles, and they both have a clear liquid in them. Then he has a medicine dropper and it takes a clear liquid from one and he drops a few drops in the other and it turns blue. Mm -hmm. And that caught my interest, you know. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, this is what we call chemical magic. He said, I have this little chemistry set at home I bought at Crest, you know, Crest and Woolworth we used to go to. He said, cost just two ninety five. He said, you might want to get you one. So I had a little truck garden, you know, at my farm and where I would sell vegetables in the city. Oh. And so I finally 
saved up my money until I got to two ninety five. <laughs> Went ahead and, and bought me a chemistry set, you know. And then later on I bought one that cost about uh, eight or nine dollars or something like that, you know. And I became interested in chemistry, you know. And I thought I wanted to be a, a research chemist, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, to me, that was that was one of the greatest things in the world. I see these guys in the movie, you know, research chemist, and I said I want to be a research chemist. And then I got to thinking, well, I like to be around people, and if you're going to be a research chemist, you're probably going to be isolated. And then I decided, well, I tell you, maybe if I were to uh, study to be a physician, that would satisfy that scientific urge and also the humanitarian urge, and so I. Uh, sort of made a compromise mm -hmm. and I decided that maybe I would go into the medical profession. And when the teachers found out that I wanted to do that, they were very, very elated about that. And they all tried to help me as much as they could and give me encouragement, you know. And uh, I would always do a little extra work in my sciences, like making charts and graphs and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. to try to learn just as much as I could learn. And every time I get my hands on the book, any kind of book, even though we didn't have a library. If I could borrow a book from somewhere, you know, want to read it, especially if it had anything in it about science, you know. And so uh, when I went to A&M, we did have a library. And then uh, that's uh, how I started studying. Then I went to A&M for two years, and then uh, I was admitted to Meharry after two years of college. And then after I got to, uh, to be a physician, when I came back, then I became Council High's football team doctor. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> what were your feelings when integration was implemented in 1966? Well, <laughs> I was one of the instigators okay. <laughs> of the integration. Um, I know that there were some people who did not feel good about it because uh, a few people lost their jobs and a few people were demoted in their jobs. And some people were transferred to schools that were way away from where they lived and so forth, you know. They had to drive farther to get to work and what have you. And I knew that some of them were, were disappointed. But um, uh, I knew that it was not going to be possible for us to have adequate facilities until we got integration, you see. Uh, our schools were separate but equal, quotation mark, okay. equal. And we know they were not equal, you know, but in, in the eyes of the authorities, they were supposed to be equal. But I felt that that never would happen until we got integration. And I knew that once we got integration, then everything would have to be equal. And that the minority kids would be able to uh, uh, attend the same schools and be subjected to the same facilities that the others were, you know. And so, um, I wanted integration. I wanted integration and I was glad when it happened. Of education changed education in America forever. As News Channel 19's Lisa Washington shows us, the Supreme Court's decision in that case opened doors of opportunity, painting a gray line for black and white America. In 2004, it's not a strange sight to see black and white students sitting in the same classroom. But this image 50 years ago would have been controversial. Back then, separate but equal meant it was against the law for black and white students to attend the same schools. In Huntsville, while white students attended Butler, Lee, and Huntsville High Schools, black students got an education at Council High. It was the only school that a minority could attend in the city. The council didn't have the same level of resources, but the dedication of teachers in terms of preparing students for the future as evidenced by the kind of graduates they turned out. Dr. Horace Rice, a business professor at Alabama A&M University, says the all-black council high gave black students its best despite the limitations. The council served us well in that it gave us the academic foundation to go out into the world and to compete in spite of the fact that there was segregation. But in 1954, that all changed with the Supreme Court's decision essentially ending school segregation. Brown was important because it, the, you have the highest court in the land saying, this is wrong. 
Dr. Clark Roundtree is a UAH professor who studies argument. He's edited a book on the 1954 decision to be released later this year. That was a tough time because suddenly you throw together blacks and whites who've been strangers to one another and there was tension in the air. Sonny Herford IV was the first student to integrate Alabama schools, escorted by his father, Sonny Herford III. He made history integrating Huntsville's Fifth Avenue School. I was too young to understand the significance or the danger, but my parents knew and they stayed with it. A historical marker was unveiled last month marking the site of the Fifth Avenue School. Huntsville schools were the first in Alabama to integrate, nine years after the court's decision. Initially, of course, you had tremendous resistance to that. I mean, Virginia closed down one of its school districts for five years to avoid integrating. So just how much has changed in 50 years? I think in terms of the, the changes in the way it, it forced society to think, uh, even if we haven't reached our goals in terms of educational segregation, it was worth it. And that's for what's in store for the next 50 years? I'm optimistic because I see more and more changes taking place, more and more doors being uh, open. Doors and opportunities being opened, thanks in part to a landmark decision. That was Lisa Washington reporting. The court's decision was handed down on May 17, 1954. It was a unanimous decision among the justices. The case originated in Topeka, Kansas, where Oliver Brown wanted to register his daughter in an all-white school that was closer to their home than the black school. With the help of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the case eventually made it to the Supreme Court. Okay. Um in summary, anything that you want to share with us about Council High School or your family? Well, um, I can say that I'm proud that I attended Council High. I had some real outstanding uh, professors at Council High. Should I name a few of them? Okay. Okay. Um, as I said before, there was Mrs. Helen Fiennes and Mrs. Susie Gandy. One thing I remember about Ms. Gandy, even today, she told us that we should never read or write, sit down to read or write without having a dictionary in front of her. Okay. And now guess what? When I read and write, I have a regular dictionary and a medical dictionary in front of me and they write in there on my shelf right now. And I always have the Mrs. Susie Gandy and Mrs. Uh, Swope who, as I say, lived right next door. Mm -hmm. Ms. Frances Swope used to right. live right next door to me before she passed. And incidentally, she sold this property to my first cousin, who went to Council High also. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was uh, uh, Mr. Keller, who was my history teacher and my uh, uh, chemistry teacher. And Mr. Rice, uh, Joe D. Rice, was my history teacher and civics teacher, and um, Mrs. Kendricks, my English professor, uh, Miss Ernestine Street, my Spanish teacher, and uh, we we really had some outstanding teachers there, and uh, I really enjoyed their classes. You know, was anxious to get to class every day, and uh, I found. When I mixed with the students at A&M and mixed with the students at Meharry, that I had had a good education. You were sharing with us earlier about back during the time before integration had taken place, yeah. things that we, places that we were not allowed to go, things that we couldn't do. Oh yes, yeah. there were a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that anything could. that you wanted to share with us yeah. about you, your family, and the things that went on at Council High. Um, now, um, when you say things, you're talking about over in the city, mm -hmm. the things that you couldn't do. Well, um... Because, like, you know, in order to get a hamburger, you had to go to the back door. Right. Well, in some places you could get a hamburger through the back door. But in some places you couldn't get a hamburger at all. Wow. <laughs> you know, you could not. There were some restaurants that had a, a separate entrance and a, a little cubby hole where someone could stand on the inside out of the weather and wait on the carry-out, you know. And there were some others where you'd have to stand on the outside and wait on the carry-out. Mm -hmm. And um, then there were some others that would not, there were some uh, restaurants and lunch counters that would not serve oh. you. See? And this is one thing that 
it bothers us. It it always it makes makes you feel inferior, you know. It seems like they went out of their way to to make you feel inferior. Um, we had some problems getting uh, uh, into the athletic fields, you know, uh, getting uh, you know to where you'd have your football games and your baseball games. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Actually, getting to we didn't have a football field as such when I was. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we, we didn't really have a playground. We didn't really have a playground um, because the, uh, uh, the uh, lot where the school was on, the school took up almost the, the entire lot, you see. So we, we didn't have a playground as such. We had a place where kids could sort of stand out there and talk during the lunch hour, you know. But, but hardly any place to play games, anything like that. And now that I look back on it, I try to think where in the world did the teachers park? They parked on the street. Mm. They had to park their cars on. The, they didn't have a parking lot that I recall, not a parking lot for the teachers who drove. And then somebody asked me, well, where did the students park? I didn't know any students who had any cars mm. when I went to school. Now you go to school, you see a lot of students driving, don't you? Mm. Well, I don't recall any students driving to school. A few of us rode bicycles to school. I used to ride my bicycle sometime to school, but I didn't know any, any students who, who actually drove. Um, but we had trouble trying to, uh, there were just a few places in town that you could rent to, uh, to actually have your uh, football game, you know. We used to go at a place called Huntsville Park, which was out west there near uh, where Stone. West Stone Middle School is yes, not too far from there. And then uh, there was a place over on, uh, I guess it was Burn Avenue called Goldsmith Schiffman Field. And we used to play football over there sometimes. But uh, otherwise, you hardly had any, anywhere to play. And uh, in the beginning, none of the games were broadcast. We finally uh, uh, talked some of the uh, radio stations in the broadcast football games. Um, yes, everything was separate and it, it was just so much prejudice and uh, so much ill will and, and hatred, you know. I just, for instance, uh, we didn't have a swimming pool, but the farm where we live had two swimming holes, two swimming holes, and the farm it was a creek that ran through the farm, mm -hmm. had two swimming holes and uh, we were tenants on the farm. And we'd go sometime down to swim, and the uh, white boys had come from the villages, Lincoln Village and Dallas Village, and they would want to swim in both of the swimming holes. And uh, then sometime if they got there first, they would designate which hole they were gonna swim in and tell us black kids where we could swim on our own farm. Yeah. And almost every day that'd be a, a rock battle, <laughs> a, a verbal confrontation, some have a rock battle, and one day erupted into a gun battle. Mm. And my brother was wounded in the gun battle, and uh, I was wishing that he had hit one of them. And then later on I thought about it, I said, well, it's probably good he did not hit one of them. He'd probably be in jail the rest of his life, because that's the way they used to do black people. There was so much disparity in there. I was telling a group uh, about three or four days ago, uh, if a black man stole a can of pork and beans, he might have to go to jail for five years. Wow. White man works at a bank, embezzled half a million dollars, six months in jail, two years probation, 20 hours community service. How mm. about that? <laughs> and then um, uh, coming back to the school situation, all the black schools had black teachers and black janitors. The white schools had white teachers only, but some of them had black janitors. Mm -hmm. But they had white instructors only. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this was this just went on for years and years and years. And even though there may be uh, black people available for work and there may be openings over at the white school, they still couldn't get hired, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. And, and see, that's that's just the way things used to be. And. Um, now, in the same way at the uh, A&M College, we call it A&M College, then it's A&M University, uh, the white students in town were not allowed to go to that university. You know. 
they, and they'd have to go out of town. Which when I was a youngster, there was no uh, white college in town at all. When I was a youngster, you mm -hmm. see, and so they would have to go out of town. And I know many of them probably wish they could have gone to A and M, but they, they could not go. And and A and M had all black teachers too. You see. <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. But that's that's just the way they wanted to wanted to try to change that. Would you share with us about Obama? and the race relation and the youth, how this is affected? Well, I guess the first thing I ought to say is that I never dreamed that I would live to see a black president <laughs> or any minority mm -hmm. get to be our president. I never dreamed that. And uh, we used to work hard with voters registration, trying to get a black president, uh, well, not necessarily a black president, trying to get uh, black people in office, period. And we felt that we could probably get some uh, people on the city council, on the school board, maybe some people in the state government. And uh, but we, we never dreamed that we'd, you know, get a black president. So we worked hard to try to, to register people and to encourage people to go and vote. So then we finally got the black president. Now what I thought was going to happen, I actually thought that uh, race relations all over the United States were going to get better. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm was going to happen, but unless I'm looking at it wrong, when I see on television, I see, it looked like to me, a lot of animosity, I see a lot of hatred, a lot of uh, uh, mean talk, and uh, people uh, not getting along, you know, I, I suspect it would, and it seemed like it's because uh, there are so many people who resent the fact that we do have a minority person in, in the White House, you know. And I'm hoping that in the near future that it will change. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm hoping it will change. But I don't know what I can do or what anybody can do to help it to change. <laughs> I'm thinking about what can I do? Uh, is it possible that, that I or uh, somebody else can do something to try to change it? Hmm. You had mentioned earlier, we were talking about um, when the schools were first integrated, mm -hmm. you had mentioned uh, three or four people. Would you share with us? The ones who integrated uh -huh, the school? Yeah. All right. Um, now, um, in the uh, fall of 1962, mm -hmm. our movement started um, January 62. And uh, by the midsummer, this was uh, July 10th, 11th, and 12th, we had gotten the restaurants, the uh, lunch counters, the ballparks, the skating rinks, the bowling alleys, the restrooms at the courthouse, and many uh, hotels, many public facilities. We had gotten that integrated by the middle of the summer. So then we began to start to think about school integration. Dr. King had come and he had spoken to us in uh, March and one of his suggestions was that we start working on school integration along with other things. But we had such a small force and we were so tied up with the other things until we really didn't get a chance to concentrate on school at that time. So in the fall of 62 we started concentrating on school and having meetings with the uh, school board. and. Uh, Whenever we would tell the school board we wanted to talk about integration, they would always put integration the last on the uh, docket. Mm -hmm. And they would talk about everything else they needed to talk about, and then they would uh, ask us to come and give our presentation about the school integration. And by this time, Brown versus Board of Education was uh, eight years old. See, so <laughs> they. Uh, uh, integrated schools were the law of the land, you see. So uh, they would put us the last on the docket and then they'd give us about uh, eight or ten minutes to make our presentation and then they'd come with a four or five minutes response. It was always negative. Their response was always negative. And then after they had given their response, then one of the school board members would vote for adjournment and it would be seconded and passed unanimously and they would leave out of the building and leave us sitting there in the building. Leave our committee sitting there in the building, even though we wanted to talk some more about school integration. 
So then we passed this petition around all over the city asking about families who were interested in school integration. And we were able to get 35 signatures of families who were interested in school integration. And then the newspaper made the list public. Okay. <laughs> the Huntsville Times made it public. And then uh, a lot of the people received threatening phone calls and some of the people lost their jobs and some of them uh, were afraid they would lose their jobs and uh, they dropped out. They asked their names to be withdrawn from the petition and uh, we knew we were going to have to file suit. So we filed the suit in the end of 63 and only four persons, only four families were left and that was uh, uh, Mrs. Odell Pearson and her daughter Veronica mm -hmm. and Miss Sidney Ann Bruton and her son uh, John Anthony Bruton and then uh, Reverend Cleveland Piggy and his son David Piggy and then I was on the suit and my son uh, Sonny the fourth and so uh, we went um, um, in August the 17th of August to Birmingham to federal court and pleaded the case and the lawyers were here from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. We had a lady lawyer, uh, attorney Constance Baker Motley, who had taken Thurgood Marshall's place when he left to go to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And she had taken his place and uh, she um, pleaded the case for us. Actually, I don't think he was in the Supreme Court yet. But uh, in a way, he had left the NACP Legal Defense Fund. And she pleaded the case and, and she won the case. So after the judge heard the case that same day, sometimes you have to wait months for rulings, you know. He ruled right from the bench. After he heard the case, he listened to, to the arguments all the morning. He listened to the closing arguments just before lunch. And when we came back after lunch, he called the attorneys into chambers. And I, I have no idea what they talked about in chambers. But they stayed in chambers about 50 to 60 minutes. And then he came back to the courtroom and uh, he announced to the you know, plaintiffs, us four families, the children were not there, just the parents. He announced, uh, he said, I'm going to have the school board to admit these four kids immediately. The school was slated to start the day after Labor Day. That's the way it always did in Huntsville, the day after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Admit these four kids, you see. And then he said, um, by January the 2nd, he said, the school board is supposed to submit to me a plan for integration of all the schools in the city of Huntsville and all the schools in the county of Madison by the 2nd of January, you see. And so, uh, we expected to get into school the day after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. But my son and I went down to the school and uh, we could not get in. Our school was locked up. Ours was going to be Fifth Avenue. They had four schools where the four children were supposed to go. And these were all on different sides of the city. Uh, we could not get in. The school was locked up. They did not let us in. They didn't let the white students in. They didn't let the teachers in. Nobody could get in school was locked up, but there was a mob in front of the school. Oh, 250, 300 people. And they were shouting obscenities and anything you can think of. And they uh, did everything they could to us except uh, actually throw rocks at us. <laughs> you know, we were trying to get in. Now, I don't know if, if you saw the black legislators as they went up the Capitol steps to sign the bill for health care. I don't know if you saw that or not. Mm. You saw it? That's what we were faced with. That same type of thing. He saw it. And uh, so we couldn't get in. And uh, we called our attorney and told her that we could not get in. And then she said, well, uh, send me a telegram and send the judge a telegram saying that you couldn't get in. So we did that. And she said, go back Tuesday. Uh, go back Wednesday and see if you can get in. So Wednesday, we attempted to get in again. Wednesday morning. Could not get in. So then um, she said, okay, we're going to go back to federal court. And we went to federal court again Thursday. 
And then Friday, they had said that we could get in. The newspaper had said we most likely would get in. And we went down there Friday, and uh, there were 12 state trooper cars, and each one had two troopers armed and helmeted, and they would not let us in. 24 state troopers to keep a six-year-old kid from getting in school. And I thought, my God, it must really be something great in that school. <laughs> you know, they don't want me to have. And see, the governor had said he was going to come and stand in the door. He he got on TV and said, no, no, those kids will not get in school. I'll come and stand in the door. But it was so many until he couldn't stand in all the doors at the same time. So he took all the troopers off the highways hmm. and sent them to those schools that were slated to be open to the black. And that was the Friday after Labor Day. And um, it was said that the leading citizens of Huntsville, white citizens, to the government told him that we might possibly lose Redstone and the Huntsville Arsenal. But we had been threatening the city government with that throughout our whole movement. Mm -hmm. So they talked to the governor and told him that uh, they might possibly lose and this uh, military installation. And then Huntsville would really be in bad shape, you know, because this was a great part of our economy, right? Yeah. And so uh, apparently the governor changed his mind. And when we went Monday morning, I'll show you the picture in a minute. We went Monday morning, we were permitted to go on into the school, went in at 8.30. And then uh, after that, the other students went in at about 30 to 40 minute intervals. Uh, we were supposed to be accompanied by the FBI. They went part of the way with us, but they did not go all the way to the school with us. And they couldn't take all the students at one time, just had two agents here in town. So they had to leave our school and go over to another school and take the other kids. But uh, before lunchtime, all of the kids went in. And then later that week, uh, Tuskegee, Mobile, and Birmingham were integrated, but we were the first. And then that Sunday, the four little girls were killed in Birmingham when they had that bombing at the 16th Church Street, the 16th Street Church, um, that um, Sunday after after the school were integrated. That gives you an idea about the timing of these things. But now I'll get those pictures and show you where we were turned away and also where we were um, uh, permitted to go in. Mm -hmm. I, don't know, I don't know if he wanted to take a picture of that or not. Okay, so how do you feel about us trying to rebuild Council High School since the other one is no longer in position and we want to rebuild and establish some other things? What's your personal feeling about thing. that? I huh? think it would be a great thing. Uh -huh. I would like to see that. Yes. Okay. I'm 100% in favor of it. Okay, keep Council High School alive. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, let's keep it alive. I had this 8 millimeter camera, you know, and so I recorded uh, the incidents that were happening in Huntsville. You know, the sit-ins, and the uh, picketing, and the boycott, and uh, all of that. Uh, Dr. King's uh, speech when he came to Huntsville, I recorded all of that. And so I made this film, a 46 minute documentary called A Civil Rights Journey. So in uh, 2004, February, I learned that uh, we were nominated, so we were in the final five. And then in the last Sunday in February, we actually won the Oscar for the movie. So we won out over those 200, 200 competitors. Evidently, they must have thought we had a pretty good movie. And this was taken at the premiere in Birmingham. The premiere of the movie was in Birmingham, and my wife and I went down for the premiere, and uh, about five other of my family members and uh, the directors brought the Oscar and they let us take a picture with it and then they put it on the plane and took it back to Hollywood. <laughs> I wish I had one to put on my mouthpiece. Dr. Hereford, could you share with us about your family, all of your family members? Yes, uh, my oldest child uh, is my son. I just have one boy, he's a uh, son in the fourth. And he is uh, working in Huntsville with the missile program. Mm -hmm. he's, he's on Redstone. But he doesn't try to figure out ways to make missiles to hurt other people. He's trying to figure out ways to protect us. 
from incoming missiles. Okay. And I tell people that I say even Governor Wallace is, so he's trying to help everybody, even even Governor Wallace's mm -hmm. family. <laughs> okay. And my my daughter, the second child is a girl and she's working in uh, Atlanta with Coca-Cola. Okay. And she's in charge of advertising and she has a budget of five hundred million dollars mm -hmm. to work with. And my uh, next uh, child is uh, uh, an English professor at Alabama a &M. and the next child is one of my twins and she's a uh, uh, psychiatric social worker at uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, my next child is one of the second twin and she has twin boys. Mm -hmm. She's in Birmingham and she has her master's in nursing and uh, the, the next one and my last child is in Jackson, Tennessee, and she uh, reads pap smears and biopsies. Okay. She's a cytopathologist. Mm -hmm. And then I have uh, six grandchildren. Some of them are grown. Uh, one of them has a master's, she's a librarian. Mm -hmm. And the other one works with uh, handicapped people. And then uh, the others are not grown yet. The others are not grown yet, but. Um, uh, one in Atlanta is in her second year of college, and then I have uh, one great grandchild who's living here in Huntsville. Okay. Uh, everybody in the family has at least two degrees, and some of them have three degrees, but that they all have at least two degrees, and every single one of them uh, finished uh, and integrated. University. <laughs> every every single one. My my grandfather, Son Hereford the first, he was born a slave. And I think he was about um, I believe um, sixteen fifteen, sixteen when uh, when the Emancipation Proclamation came out. And then uh, my father was um, um, a soldier in uh, World War II, excuse me, World War I, World War I. And uh, I guess the first thing I need to say about my father, uh, when he was a child, he planted some trees, I want to tell you about them. Uh, if you're going north on the parkway and you come to Sparkman, at the red light, look to your right, you'll see an American Legion hut surrounded by a grove of walnut trees. My daddy planted those a hundred years ago. Wow. And uh, he was in World War uh, One, and he said that uh, uh, when they got ready to come home after the uh, officers had been declared that his commanding officer called them in to talk to them, a uh, great big crowd of soldiers, and he told them, he said, uh, in a few short weeks we're going to be going home. And he said, I realize that some of you are married to the French women and you have young children. And I realize that some of you have babies on the way. He said, now, you colored boys, you cannot take your wives home. He said, you have two options. You can get a discharge from the army and stay in France with your wife, or you can get a divorce from your wife and come home with your unit. But there are no other options. Mm. How about that? And then uh, my, my brother uh, served in the Philippines in, in World War II. But my father was a minister, a farmer, and a real estate man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, my brother was a barber, a teacher, and a farmer. Okay. So you father was the pastor of St. James. St. James I just and your brother yeah, I just, I just is remember the pastor the picture now. picture up there. Uh -huh. <clears throat> your yeah. brother is the pastor now. He founded St. James. He built St. James. When I say built it, I mean he physically built it. Mm -hmm. He and some of his friends and relatives physically built it with the hammer and the saw. Okay. <laughs> when I say he built it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I used to sing in the choir. Oh. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> right. When I tell, tell my uh, friends and relatives I used to sing in the choir, they just die laughing because they know I can't sing well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was about, I guess, uh, six, eight, ten years old when I used to sing <laughs> in the choir. He passed when I was 13. Oh, okay. And uh, right after he passed, my brother was drafted. And, uh, so you were born in Huntsville or in Tony or what area? Right there where the Dairy Queen is on Max Luther. That's where right. I'm going, right there, very right. spot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, but anyway, I've been fighting for uh, civil rights and gender rights ever since I was a youngster. I tell you, the, the first time that uh, I was really involved with uh, a real, what I consider us strong civil rights activity. I was at A&M and I believe I was at the end of my freshman year and I got a notice to come down to the post office early one morning uh, that I'd been drafted and they said that we're going to take you to the post office cafe and feed you and then take you to Nashville to get your physical. And so I came down to the post office cafe that morning and we went down there and they had us standing on the sidewalk and we could look inside through the uh, curtains and we could see waiters in the uh, restaurant pouring coffee, pouring orange juice and pouring ice water. And I thought, well, my God, this man's army may not be so bad because I was from the country. I never had had ice water for breakfast, you know. So uh, he unlocked that door and he let us in, 30 Caucasian boys and 15 black boys. And he said, you white boys sit at these tables. He said, you color boys, follow me. I'm going to take you back here and we're going to feed you in the kitchen. He took us in the kitchen and he handed us a plate to hold in our hand. The kitchen was just a little bit larger than this room. Fifteen of us in there holding a plate and getting ready to go fight for freedom. And that's how he gave us our breakfast, just like that. And in about Ten seconds, I heard the first plate hit the floor. It was a concrete floor. And my own boy slammed his plate down on the floor, and then it was a chain reaction. Every one of those recruits slammed that plate down on the floor like that. Eggs and bacon went everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we looked over there in the corner, and he had crates of apples and oranges. We busted open the crates and filled out pockets with apples and oranges and went and got on the bus. Mm. Back of the bus. Had to get on the back of the bus. Went to Nashville, got to the Army base, everybody was equal. Went to Chow at noon, everybody sat down at the table together and ate. Five o'clock, they had finished the examinations, put us back on the bus to bring us back to Huntsville. Mm -hmm. The back of the bus. Put all the black boys on the back of the bus again. But that's, that's what we had to do. That was my first participation in a real active run. And now there's three of those guys that are still living in Huntsville and every time we see each other we laugh about that. <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you this. So when we slammed the place down on the floor, somebody said, boy, they might put us in jail. And somebody said, guess what? They can't put us in jail and send us to Korea too. <laughs> they said they either got to keep us in jail or send us to Korea. They can't do both. <laughs> but anyway, that was my very first uh, activity with civil rights, and I've been fighting for civil rights ever since. I, I gave a presentation at a college one time, and they listed on the program Dr. Sonny Hereford, Huntsville, Alabama, former civil rights activist. And I asked the people to take their pencil and scratch out former. I said, I've been fighting for civil rights <laughs> for 60 years, mm -hmm. and when I get on my deathbed, I'll still be <laughs> fighting for civil rights.